It's an Englishman in the Balkans podcast. We have been dormant, sleeping, hibernating uh, during the summer. Uh, I think the last proper episode went out in May. My goodness, it's a long time ago. But we're back and we're starting with a pretty exciting story. I think it's exciting anyway. Why? Because I think there's a lot of parallels to my experience as well. But we're going to find that out because I've done precious little prep here. You know me. Uh, I wing it. There's a lady on Substack, and I'm on Substack. That's where my blog is. And I came across this lady, and I thought, this, this is pretty interesting. Because the thing that attracted me was her family name. And it, I said, that's, 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 a, that's a Western Balkan name, and it's on Substack, and it ain't too many of us here. So I have to get in touch. Today, uh, I'm in the village here in Chidarchini, in northwest Bosnia. Um, Camilla, who's the lady we're going to find out about now, is living, I believe, in northern Slovenia, very, very close to the Austrian border. Her name is Camilla Dugonic. She's also um, a, a lady that has come from the United States to this part of the world. She's going to tell us about that. And also, she's married to a bit of a celebrity, so we might find a little bit uh, about that as well. Thank you, David. Yes, I'm excited to be here and chat a bit about this weird, weird life, this weird chapter of life that we found ourselves in. Um, who am I? That's a big question for a mom of, of two little girls. So I guess we'll start with that. I'm a mother. I am a writer. I've done many things in my life. Uh, career-wise, none of them have panned out <laughs> as I anticipated that they would. Um, but um, now I find myself in a very unique uh, position. And I grew up in uh, California, in Silicon Valley. So my uh, upbringing was very much about uh, success, career, progress, technology, you know, really we were we we grew up in the heart of all of the excitement uh and my parents were very involved in all that as well so for them the idea that i have kind of turned my nose up at traditional <laughs> career world uh, and i'm living in a tiny weekend house in northern slovenia is a, a bit of a it's taken some getting used to in, in my family but um yes i i, ma I met my husband uh Demir, or Damir, if we want to be correct, uh, in uh, when we were in university at the University of California, Berkeley, and he was a tall, attractive swimmer, and I was a tall rower, and I just we kind of spot each other, each other spotted each other from across the room, and we're like, oh, you know, there's some connection here, and and when I found out that he was actually of Bosnian origin, his family is from northeast Bosnia, um, I. Um, I was very excited about that because um, we had some shared cultural, uh, shared culture, given that I'm half Algerian as well. So, um, and uh, we got married young, 23. I was 23. He was 22. Uh, there was need for a green card in America. And, uh, you know, we got married young. And then we ended up moving to Slovenia when I was uh, just, I think, just 26 because he was training for the Rio Olympics, and he was going to do that here. And we, um, we moved into this tiny house and um, prepared for those Olympics. And then we found out that we were pregnant with uh, our first daughter, ended up moving back to America to become a mother, uh, because I thought that it would be easier to be surrounded by my culture and what was comfortable for me in that transition. And then five years in uh, the North Pacific Northwest, I found myself just dreaming of this land and I couldn't get it out of my head. I couldn't get it out of my head for those five years. We built a house, we sold it. We sold 70% of everything that we owned and packed our animals and our two babies at that point, two babies and um, ended up moving back here three years ago. So now I find myself in a very unique uh, position compared to all my friends. I have a good amount of time to do the things I like to do. And um, I'm finding that I'm loving writing. And so now here I am talking to you. <laughs> it seems that when you were talking about having come to Slovenia and then returning um, to the United States and having this 
dream, this pull uh, uh, of this region. Uh, I wonder if you have the same, or you would describe it the same as I describe it. When people say to me, what is it, what is it about Bosnia and Herzegovina for me? And I always say, well, it's easy, isn't it? I mean, it's the, it's the Hotel California. I mean, you can check out, but you can never leave. Is that the same for you? Yes. Yes. It, 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 for me, when I first uh, met my husband and started exploring this part of the world, I, I remember, I mean, I was 20, 21 years old the first time I actually went to Slovenia and Bosnia because we, we, we traveled to Bosnia quite a bit. And um, it was like growing up as an American, this might, this might be unique to Americans, but we kind of think that anything east of the wall is this uh, socialist kind of, you know, built. We just have this idea in our head of soup kitchens. And and so I didn't even think about this part of the world, really, until I set foot in it. And it was as if like this mask had been ripped off my face and I could see, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, <laughs> this is the most beautiful land. These people are warm and open and kind. And I just it like it grabbed hold of me and go, having gone then once we lived here it was like it became a part of me especially my connection with the natural um the natural elements of the area that we live and 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 the whole region of the balkans really um and so when i went back to america i was missing something it was pretty profound and uh i felt quite empty um while i was there even though life was very, very full and busy. So yeah, I, I think it, it just grabbed hold of me. You're going to see my, one of my little uh, Slovenian treasures here. <laughs> um, I, 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 one of the, yeah, I have a lot of similarities to you and I, I think we're going to realize that, but I want to do this from the get go. Um, my language skills after all these years, I mean, I speak very, very good German. I'll brag about that, mm -hmm. but there's no way I could brag about speaking the local language of Bosnia Herzegovina, which is always, are, are you speaking Serbian? Are you speaking Croatian? Are you speaking yes. Bosnian? Which is a massive hurdle. And you, it's like a minefield here. Yes. Um, and, 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 and when I've talked to people about the former Yugoslavia, that, you know, as you were talking about, east of the wall nearly, um, and it wasn't too many years ago somebody said, but David, there were three languages in, in, in Yugoslavia. And I, what? Yeah, there was Slovenian, there was Serbo-Croatian, and there was Macedonian. And I've mm -hmm. had the pleasure to meet Slovenian guests here and also to hear them communicate in Slovenian, which is, I mean, mind-blowing for me. So how is it with you and your language? Have you managed to conquer any of it? Or, or are you like me? I speak, a little, well, we'll say I speak Serbian, right? So I, people say, what language do you speak? And I say Serbsklish, because it's just this amalgam of two languages, which I seem to get by with. How has it been for you linguistically? Yeah, that's a great question and a very uh, important one in the country of Slovenia. Uh, so I grew up speaking many languages. I spoke uh, French as a child, took Spanish for 10 years, graduated fluent in it that's all gone now. Uh, and then I, I met my husband and I started learning Bosnian because that's how his mom communicated to me at first was in Bosnian. She doesn't speak any English. Most of his family don't speak any English whatsoever. So I quite quickly picked up some basic Bosnian to uh, communicate. And then I, once we had made the choice to raise our children here in Slovenia, I really decided that I had to tackle the Slovenian language. And the Slovenian language is unlike anything I have ever attempted in my life. I mean, it is, it's, it's on the list. It's, I've read lists where Slovenian is one of the top five most difficult languages in the world to master. It is, it's just, uh, there's a lot of rules and there's many, many, many dialects in this country. I mean, like it's a very small country of 2 million people and one town to the next will speak differently. So, so I, I learned that quite quickly, I was going to need uh, some professional help got some classes. And I would say that I can communicate in Slovene. I have a thick accent uh, from the region that I'm in, which is a little bit, I would equate to kind of like the American South. I'm sure there's in, in, in the UK, there's, I mean, there's many accents across the UK as well, but it's, it's a, it's a very thick uh, and strong accent. The rest of Slovenia kind of laughs at us and how we speak. Um, and yeah, I, I 
I'm very uh, insecure about it, <laughs> but I'm, I'm assured by everyone around me, wow, you speak so well all the time. They're just very happy that someone's attempting to speak their language because it's so challenging. This dialect has a lot of German in it, actually, because we're right on the Austrian border. So there's a lot of uh, German sounding words or even German words like a house here is Baita and a, a chimney is a Raufung and uh, the rest of Slovenia would not understand those things. So um, it's it's the, probably the biggest challenge of my life in living here is the language, uh, language and driver's license, because that's a whole other saga. But um, the language it's a fun challenge. I hope I master it someday. I really like look forward to being able to communicate well, but to be honest, it, it, that, that, that's a, it's a deeper question for me, the language issues, because I feel often that as a, that's been the biggest transformation for me in moving here is that I've lost my, uh, one of my tools in life, you know, one of them, you can't really charm people as easily when you don't, uh, the, the, the banker, the guy who's, you know, helping you plumb your new bathroom or whatever it is. Like you can't, you can't have that banter and that discourse as easily. And I really, I learned, had to learn quickly to uh, find other ways to communicate with people and connect. And, but yeah, the language is tough. I mean, and and my other biggest problem is that I speak uh, so, some Bosnian, and so I often throw in the Bosnian word instead of the Slovenian word, and I'll get some looks sometimes, like, because they are pretty. They're the the Slovenian language is precious. It's very precious to them, and and I think it's because it's a small country, and it means a lot to them. And so I do my best, but I wouldn't say I'm great. <laughs> I wouldn't say I've mastered it. You don't know how much that has meant to me listening to that because I'm here on my own. And I honestly, I mean, I can get by, right. My, my restaurant language is, is great. And like you, the family that I'm, that I have, that I have been part of, right. There's, there's only one young girl. She's oh got 20 now. She is. There's only Victoria and, and my wife that speaks English. Everybody else. Yeah. I, I've, I've just got to get by. Having said that, Two or three glasses of rakia, you get you're getting there. It's it's like yeah. a it's like a help. It flows. <laughs> it does. Um, what do you think has been, apart from the language, uh, the biggest? Maybe culture shock is the wrong phrase to use, but I'll say it anyway. What has big been the the, the biggest cultural difference for you from coming from the United States? Um, to this, and I, I do say this honestly, this pretty unique region. Yeah, it is. It is a pretty unique region. Uh, um, there's, I mean, on a, on a, maybe on a certain level, being a mother in this region, coming from, um, uh, coming from America, I have very different ideas of, uh, what, is healthy, I suppose I would say, for example, and and, it, and and to my in-laws credit, they have done an amazing, amazing job of accepting me and my ideas, all my crazy American ideas. My children are barefoot frequently and uh, very rarely wear caps, hats when it's cold and I let them have wet hair, which is uh, almost illegal, it feels like sometimes here. And I get in quite a bit of trouble. People ask me questions about this all the time. So there's some shallow things like that where, you know, yeah, okay, we disagree on like Promaha. I don't know if you, call, you guys call it Promaha or Promaya, but you know, uh, the well, wind. Uh, and hey, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, funny you should say that. I was going to ask you that because um, in two days time <laughs> on Substack, there's a video uh, that I've made about Zrak and Promaya. So what, we won't, we won't, there we go. I can guess that, but how has it been? <laughs> you know, you, you tell me what your experience has been with Promaya because I mean, it's going to be pretty unique for people that are watching and listening to this. Yeah, for me, Promada is, uh, it's, it's, I, a little bit, so my husband was a big believer in it until he came to America because for, for university. And he just, I remember his mind being like, so none of you, none of you are scared. And I was like, no, we, the fresh air and wind is a good thing. It's a good thing to have cool air, you know, a nice cool breeze on your face or on your neck even. And, um, 
And he just, his mind was blown. So he came back telling everybody, it's not true. It's not true. <laughs> it's not a real thing. But I think, I don't know if I actually agree with that because I think that it really depends on how you grow up, what you believe, what your body's used to. And, but for me, it's, it, they, I get a lot of, uh, I mean, still to this day, if I even think about, if I even look like I'm going to sit on the ground in certain months of the year, one of the uncles will say, get up, get up, you're going to get sick. And so I, I've had to kind of be like, no, I'll be okay. But there's stuff to be learned from that as well. And I try to keep a, a bit of humility with it. We just are, there's a very different, you know, view of health. And then on the, at the, to, on that same note, I feel like a lot of people here are far more connected with nature and natural uh, forms of healing, you know, tea from herbs in the garden or mushrooms from the forest or, you know, I, and I really appreciate that and learn from that as well. So I think there's a lot for me to learn from it. Um, I still struggle with the idea of Zopata. I don't, I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big uh, Zopata wearer or Papucha in Bosnian. <laughs> and um I, uh, but on a deeper level of, of the cultural change, I, I would say it's, it's the American in me. Everyone likes to tell me that Americans are fake. Oh, that's a, that's a big question I get. Why are you guys so happy? You guys, it's fake, right? It's fake. You seem very cheery and you talk to the people at the grocery store and it's those things that have been the most difficult for me. When you go to ring up your groceries and the, and the, the teller doesn't have a conversation with you a quick little bit of banter to make your day sweeter. Uh, those are the kind of culture shock moments where I have to stop and be like, whoa, whew, everything's okay. She doesn't hate me. I I'm going to be okay if I don't get that little bit of, you know, um, fun throughout the day with strangers. People are a little bit more closed, uh, especially in Northern Slovenia, in this specific region of Northern Slovenia as well. And um, I find a, a different experience when I'm in Bosnia, though. I will, I will say that there's there are ch there are changes from region to region and country to country, and um, so I think that's been my biggest challenge is learning how to connect with people without the overly uh, flamboyant. Mm, I don't know it. Our our overly flamboyant essence that we have in America, uh, and I think that it's been good because there's genuine connection and. I've learned, I've evolved as a person, so I can't, uh, it's, it's taken some time to get used to it. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but 20, 22 years down the line, and I'm still going down, going down that route. By the way, uh, here, the English, we are looked at as being uh, uber cold. You know, we... Oh, we really? Don't, yeah, we don't, we don't show emotion. Um, you go to a funeral... Uh, and I just stand there and they go, is, is, yes, is, I said, in, you know, in, in my culture, you know, if some, everybody yeah. stands there quiet, everybody doesn't say anything. And the most you'll get is if a guy, if it's his best friend, he might wring his hat in his hands for yeah. a little bit, but yeah. the show of emotion yeah. uh, is, is, a, is an amazing yeah. show of weakness for, for, for Northern Anglo-Saxons in um, from where I've come from. So Camilla, you, you, you're this rower, right? In California, yes. yes. Um, and you come to Slovenia. You're in a weekend. It's a, a weekend house. From the photographs on 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 your publication and what you write about, I mean, it's nothing more than idyllic, really. Yes, it is. I mean, I pinch myself often. I it's idyllic in in the one sense. It's very picturesque. We have a massive garden that I put a lot of work into and we grow an amazing amount of food. We are at um, just shy of 900 meters altitude. So it's a, it's a challenge to grow food uh, this high sometimes, but I've just really loved that challenge. Um, I have time because I'm not chasing the hustle and bustle of my old life, which was very busy, very stressful, very... Uh, money driven. And now we've chosen to live this simple life. But I mean, so idyllic, yes, but sacrifices were made, many of them and are made on a daily basis. When I compare my life to some of my friends back in the States, you know, we don't have a dishwasher. We grow all our own food for the most part, much of our own food. We store it in the, our root cellar. 
So that's a lot of work in, in the summer for me. Um, we forage a lot of what we can't grow and our meats and, you know, um, our beef comes from our neighbor's farm and I, I, um, I butcher it into the cuts myself. So I've had to learn how to do that. So there's a lot more work involved in our daily lives. We make our own juices. We don't make rakia. We get rakia from Bosnia, but <laughs> we make our own juices. And, uh, you know, much of what we consume is, is my labor. And, and then of course I cook it all myself and we have our own sourdough bread and, you know, it, it's, it's idyllic, but it's I, I, an idyllic situation that takes a lot of work and a lot of letting go of what I thought was important, like Amazon Prime, for example, one to two day delivery. That's not going to happen here. Sometimes the the postman, not sometimes the delivery men don't even want to drive up this hill. And so they'll just say, ah, I don't want to come up today. I'm going to leave it here or I'll come in a couple days. And so all the conveniences of my old life were stripped away. Also, uh, a, a normal sized home with two children um, and three animals. We have a very small house and a very small kitchen, one bathroom for all of us. And I just like, there's a lot of hardship in that, that I think a lot of people would not be willing to experience. But for me, if that's the cost of the freedom that I have to talk to you right now or grow my garden or go into the woods and grab a basket of porcini and really most importantly above all else to have time for my children to be present in their lives uh i'll i'll take it and i really think that living in the small house has has made me just a better human again growing up i'm from san francisco i mean i was born in san francisco california so i this the standard of living that i was you know chasing when I was younger was extremely different from what I have decided is what is right for our family now. And I'm just really grateful that I got here. I don't think I would have ever, ever come to this uh, place mentally about, you know, this is a much deeper subject, but about my goals and dreams in life and what actually matters to me if I hadn't come to this part of the world and had kind of just my eyes opened to a very different uh, way of living and I'm really happy that we do it. I'm so grateful for it. Your children were, uh, are growing up in a in a lifestyle that you, you would never have even countenanced when you were their age, right? This would never ever happen. How how do you describe to them um, the differences in when you were a child of their age and what they're experiencing now? I mean, do they do they see your life, your previous life, if I can put it that way, as being something that they will never experience? I, you know, we left when my oldest was four, about to turn five, and my youngest was five months old. So uh, I'm not sure how much memory, how many memories they're going to have of of their old life, but they know it exists. They've seen the pictures. They know what house we used to live in. They know that we used to work, uh, you know, full-time jobs and barely see them. And, um, I think my kids, I'm really, I talk about it a lot, probably to their annoyance, but I, I never stop reminding them how rare this is and how lucky we are to have this lifestyle in part because we were brave enough to choose it. And we, and because we were lucky enough to have the option to choose it, that that's a big part of this. I know a lot of people don't have an out of the rat race, um, but we were pretty brave to let go of everything that, you know, we, we had and we knew. Um, but my, my children to them, I mean, it just seems so normal. Like they drink herbal tea that I harvest from the, I write a lot in my, on my sub stack about, um, how much I love a, a, a weedy garden full of, cause all the weeds are the good, the good things in, in a, in a lawn, the clover and the dandelion and the, and the wild thyme creeping through. And there's so much goodness in, in what seems to be something so common. And I just love that they, they know that, that they drink that tea every night without question. And that they know that mommy's going to go out and pick it's red clover time. We got to go pick the red clover. They seem very just, it's like it's natural. They, they don't fight it. And and I will say, you know, we're a bit unique even in our area for how we live. Um, so I think that um, 
they know that kids live different ways. They know that other kids can, you know, buy a lot of candy from the store or buy or watch, you know, TV during the week, which we don't do. And I'm a, I'm a bit of a strict mom. And um, they know those things. They're aware that their life is different than other other kids, but they seem to understand it. And just my oldest, who's almost eight, explains to her friends, oh, yeah, my mom doesn't let me watch TV during the week. You know, I have I read books. I go outside. I play. She's just kind of that's how it is. This is how it is. This is what we've chosen. And. I think it, it fits them. It suits them. She's also, I will say this, she's an expert mushroom hunter. I mean, she would rather go hunt for porcini, um, yurchki as they're called here, every, any moment of any day than, than play games or, you know, be on a tablet or anything like that. She's just, she's, she's a bit wild. And I love that about her. And I'm glad we've, we've given her the option to explore that. What a fortunate young lady she is. On your Substack, you're documenting everything that you're doing with your garden uh, and your property down to having even in a tiny house, if I can put it that way, you have a gym. I mean, come on, you've got some luxuries there. Um, and we'll yes. talk about the sauna in a minute. But the thing is, how how difficult is it for you to articulate in your substack with all those beautiful imagery images that you have to, to color your pieces, um, it, it must be physically exhausting to do all this work on the land and equally mentally exhausting to take all that information, all those experiences, all those emotions and put it in into the posts that you write so eloquently. I mean, the storytelling is amazing, but how difficult in the real world is that to achieve? You know, I've always had a lot to say. So I, I used to kind of channel it in being a bit too, maybe, so, I don't know in what ways it used to come out, but I found that, especially since I started this specific project, I've been writing for, um, I've been documenting my life for 15 years now. I, much of my old uh, work I've I've made private now because I, I wanted to open a new chapter with this project and really focus my, my everything in this. And I've also had to get rid of all of social media. That, that's a big part of my experience is getting rid of all social media except Substack so that I can actually focus on the work that I'm doing. And while I'm doing all that physical work in the garden and in my kitchen and, and in the forest, I'm paying attention to what's happening. So, you know, I always am like paying attention to the stories that are unfolding. When I wrote a piece recently about wild thyme and how wild thyme here is a it's a very important herb. It's called Materina Dushitsa, which translates to mother's soul. And I I have this experience in my life when, when I smell thyme, it reminds me of my mother because of how she cooked and my grandmother as well. And so while I was picking the thyme and thinking about, I, I spent my time thinking about, oh, this reminds me of my mom. The story kind of comes together in my head as I'm doing the work. So that's what I've found has been a really, the most rewarding experience of this substack adventure and this this specific project a year of good work is um that the story comes to me the wisdom that i'm seeking comes come to me when, while i'm actually physically doing the work and i feel like there's it's something um pretty powerful for me i i don't know where it's coming from but i i just it's like i sometimes it doesn't it doesn't always happen but there are times when i'm in the work and i feel okay all the pieces are coming together in my head. So I do the work and then I go write the story right after. So yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it takes a lot of effort, but it's, I, I would, I have to get it out. You know, it would be, it would be, uh, it would be almost painful to hold on to those, those, <laughs> you know, the story that's piecing together and it had to be almost painful if I couldn't write it down and share it. Social media, which you, you said about leaving behind, um, yeah, I've done that, but and I haven't gone back. But it 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 was a, a time sucker. It just like took a lot mm -hmm. of things away from my life. But when you look, or let's think, when we remember being on on social media and and and, and that platform called Instagram, which always gave these picture perfect views of people's lives. When people read your Substack, and I'm going to put a link to wherever 
this is either video or audio, when they come and read your Substack, it, it, it does show this really wonderful life, but you have had some setbacks, you know, when you were doing composting at one stage, and you could tell through through reading it that you were exceedingly disappointed, may, maybe to the point of crying, uh, maybe to the point of <laughs> I, I, I need to leave ice. this for, for, for a bit. Do you feel... I mean, most people that use social media um, just look and try and portray this uh, picture-perfect life, as I call it. Um, but you do show some, not some, a lot of vulnerab vulnerability. D yeah. Does that make you feel insecure or are you strong enough to say, I don't care what people think? Because that's something I, 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 I do struggle with. When you have vulnerab vulnerabilities, I always try to find a way that I don't show it too much. Whereas I think you are a pretty open book. How difficult is it? Yeah, if anything, I I, I try my struggle is to to contain it. I, I I if anything, I've worked in my life to find a way to keep things a little bit more sacred, which is I think why this project has been so so rewarding to me is that I'm able to pick and choose. Whereas social media feels like kind of an onslaught, like you have to participate so frequently and it's very it's not very well thought out necessarily, at least not how I did it. And I felt like I was always trying to match up to someone's expectation of, you know, what looks good. Whereas with Substack, I, I'm ex I'm having an experience with it where I just share like the truth of my life, the truth of my day, my my life, my daily life is very beautiful. It is very very beautiful because we live on this mountain hillside with an incredible view, and I'm surrounded by stunning nature but when you read the words you'll you can see that i've you know struggled battled postpartum depression deeply and um you know being a foreigner in 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 a land struggling with the language can be quite lonely quite isolating and you face i have faced a lot of my demons in this experience and i think that that's a really um valuable thing to share i think that's actually where like the juice is in life and the, really the good stuff because um, that's, I think how we connect better with one another. And that's, you know, is, is, oh, I see that I've struggled with that feeling as well. How did you get through that? Oh, you use this technique or now your words take on a different meaning because I know that this is what is feeding them. This is the experience that sort of guided you there. So I, I think vulnerability is really important. I need to learn how to, and I'm, and Substack has helped me with that. I need to learn how to uh, keep certain elements of my life sacred. Um, my children are a big part of that. Like they're, they make me who I am, but I'm not really open to sharing their faces on online anymore. And I had in the past on Instagram, which I have since deleted everything, but, um, I just, yeah, I think it's a much more thoughtful platform and a much more thoughtful, like it takes time. You have to think about, putting together a piece and what you want to share. And I find that the community on Substack is a million times kinder as well. I mean, really just excited about life and hearing people's stories. They just want to read stories, at least the community that, that I'm, I've become a, you know, a part of, and I, I'm so grateful for that platform. Uh, I was, I was doing the project on its own website initially before I moved it onto Substack. And uh, I was hesitant to go on Substack because I thought, Oh, I don't know if I want comments or anything this is such a personal project for me and it's very important to me and i wasn't sure i wanted input or feedback um but i found that it's it's actually served to inspire me even more and more stories are coming out more things i want to share so we'll probably end up be doing another year of good work so i'm i'm really excited to keep that going um but i just i'm so grateful for the platform i don't know if you found the same experience but Oh, it's a, it's a special place. It's it's certainly different, and it suits me. I'm not a writer. Yeah, I'm I'm a hobbyist, but for me, it's 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 great. Um, do you know we're just using S words today? Slovenia, Substack, and two that I want to get out of you now. Um, <laughs> that sourdough and saunas. How many people in Slovenia <laughs> have have saunas when they have big houses? And you've got a sauna, which looks like the cutest, amazing thing in the world, um, right on your <laughs> property. What what made you want to have 
a sauna because saunas and the Balkans, I, I just don't see the connection there. <laughs> yeah, well, it's Slovene Northern Slovenia, where we are, we're in a region called Koroška. Uh, in English, it's Carinthia, and it part of part of it extends into Austria as well. And I, uh, several of my neighbors have saunas in their basements. Um, and, you know, the health spas in Slovenia all all have saunas. So I would say Slovenia might be a little more uh, open to the, the, the practice of sauning uh, more than uh, more than I've seen in Bosnia. Most of our most of our Bosnian family members asked if it was a, a meat smoker when we were building it because it looked it looked like a meat smoker. And I think that is the priority. <laughs> so, which okay, maybe one day if we never want to we don't want to do it anymore, it could turn into a, a great meat smoker. Um, but yeah, we since. I suffer or suffer. I have a, I've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is an, an autoimmune disease that affects your thyroid. And, um, I've been dealing with it for, since I was pregnant with my first, my firstborn. And I, um, can't tell you, I just, it's my body craves the sauna. I, it, it was one of our non-negotiable items when we moved back, We're like sauna, we have to do a sauna right away. And my husband is a, yes, he is a former Olympic swimmer, but he, after he retired from swimming, he built houses for five years. So he had the skills to do it himself. And he chose a little spot on our property and we've got a big window and the view out of it is incredible. And I pinch myself. I pinch myself every time I'm in it. I mean, I cannot believe that it's ours because it's such a, uh, a sweet little structure and the view is incredible. And I have a garden bed right below it that I plant strategically for me to enjoy the view out of the, out of the sauna as the things grow. And actually, amazingly, this, uh, this season, this summer, I planted a, a big row of sunflowers, just expecting to enjoy some sunflowers. But what it's turned into is this like bird party. And all these little birds are there all day long picking off the sunflower seeds. And so I sit in the sauna and I just stare at them preparing for the winter the same way that I'm preparing for the winter by filling my root cellar with potatoes and, and the squash from my garden. They're doing the same thing as me. And I just sit there and I, I can't believe, I can't believe how cool it is. And it's a really wonderful time of reflection. It's a bit of a physical challenge. And when there's snow, it's extra fun because we jump in the snow afterwards and probably make everyone around us, uh, like lose their minds thinking we're crazy. But, um, it's, it was a great project. I think everyone should build a sauna. I really have a strong, I'm a very pro sauna advocate. I'm going to try and persuade Tamara to do that. Although I think her parents, yes. who are pretty conservative with a small C, um, they might say, David, you know, <laughs> you're gloopy at the best of times and, uh, and maybe this isn't uh, one of them. But one of the things that I was taking as well, and I said to Tamara, look at these pictures, is, is the skill that, you ladies have, and gentlemen as well, in making sourdough bread. I'm always fascinated what people can do with a razor blade in, in, inside that dough before they put it in um, for baking. Sourdough seems to be a passion with you as well, and, and you've had your ups and downs yeah. with it. Was it something that yeah. you brought with yourself from the United States, or was it something that you, you decided to take up when you came here? I started making sourdough bread right when I had my second daughter. So we were still in America. Um, I had been making a form of uh, no need bread for a long time with commercial yeast, but uh, sourdough uh, felt really liberating to me because you don't need anything. You really just need flour and water and the beautiful wild yeast in the air around you. And I found that to be a, a large part of what I do is that I really like the feeling of freedom and non-dependence on, or a very limited dependence on the systems around me. And so sourdough fits into that very, very well. And um, I had a couple of friends who were doing it, uh, but it took me a really long time to figure it out. And it's taught me a lot. I wrote a, I wrote a piece about uh, how sourdough bread tames your ego because you think you have it mastered. And then, you know, something, something happens to your starter and it's just like, oh, no, nope, we're going to, you know, we got to adapt. And so you kind of, there's many people who claim to be masters online. And there are so many people who are amazing at sourdough, much better than me. But every time it works out for me, it feels like a miracle. And I have so much fun with it because it's just so exciting. I mean, I've been doing it for 
you know, four years now. And I just, every loaf is like, oh, how it's magic. You know, I, I worked with these invisible yeasts and, and I created something that's so good. So um, my children are a bit spoiled when it comes to that. They now, they, they're pretty snobby when it comes to their bread. And uh, that's maybe a slight mistake I've made is only, only giving them that, but it's really healthy. It's much better for our guts and it's, it's fun. It's really, really satisfying to do it well. And when you don't do it well, you can still eat it. You know, you cut it up for stuffing or croutons or breadcrumbs or, or just, but it's, it's a good lesson in patience with yourself, you know, consistency. I've, I've enjoyed it so much. Does your sourdough starter have a name? It doesn't. I know most people's do. Oh, I, mine doesn't. I got my starter from a neighbor here. So there are a lot of people here doing sourdough as well, uh, especially in the countryside. I need to give her a name. Yeah. Tamara's is called Chica. I don't know why, but she wanted to call it Chica. Um, Kimberly, there's a lot of similarities be, be, between us. I know that. Um, I think I think people that consume my content if that's the right phrase still to use when it comes to Substack, but nevertheless um know what i am but i'm going to ask you this question you've got three options here so what are you okay are you are you an expat are you an immigrant or are you an in-betweener oh that's difficult that's a quite a question <laughs> that is quite a question I think I'm an in-betweener. I wouldn't describe myself as an expat or an immigrant. I think I'm an in-betweener. And all the room that that gives me. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a, yeah, I, I, I feel a bit like an anomaly most days. You know, I'm, I'm kind of the one who stands out a little bit here. I remember, I remember one time I was walking down the street and my husband drove by and I was, we were down in town and I, I was walking somewhere. He saw me walking somewhere and I, he called me and he said, you look, what's going on? You have a smile on your face. That's so weird. And I was like, why is that weird? I'm, I'm walking. The, the air feels good. I, I just have a little smile on my face. And I had noticed that people kept looking at me as I was, as I was walking. And once he drove by and said, it's, it's because you're smiling. It's, you look a little crazy here, you know, and, and I, I've, I've, that's stood out to me a bit that I'm always going to look a little crazy, a little different. So I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever fully like mesh with the culture here entirely, but I certainly uh, don't feel very attached to my Americanness anymore. Um, so I'm not sure. My parents also, uh, I should say, my parents have moved. Um, they're now in Trieste in Italy, which is about three hours from us here. And it's a very, very unique city in Italy with a lot of Slavic uh, influence. And sometimes I hear more Serbian there than I do uh, Italian when I'm in that city. It's a wonderful city. And um, so I don't have much back home anymore, you know? I, I, yeah. I go back very rarely now to the United Kingdom, and yeah. I read somewhere, uh, and it and it resonated with me is, if I ever did go back, I'm not going to. But if I ever did, I would be totally lost. A lot of people yeah. from the United States that have been in Europe long time, uh, for a long period rather, and when they've gone back, they said, now we are totally lost. We we left what we knew from the United States and we spent 20, 30 years in this other country, got used to the culture, assimilated as best as possible. And then for some unknown reason, went back and they said, now we're totally lost because we're not, we're nothing now. We're not, we can't even identify with our country of, of birth. So for us in between us, I'm an in-betweener for, for us in between <laughs> us, it, um, we are, we are pretty unique, but it does carry a certain amount of, Immers uh, emotional turmoil, or it does. It does for me. Yeah, I'm. I'm not one. Yeah, or the yeah. Other. Absolutely. I, I actually like being in the middle. I actually do like being in the middle because I've got the richness, rich, richness of what I had, and I've got the richness yeah. of what I'm. I, I'm living. 
Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I feel like it's a more, for me, in, in my experience as, as an in-betweener, now I can confidently say I'm an in-betweener as well. And I, I feel for me that it allows me to live a very authentic, and I, I don't love that word because I think it's been overused in society, especially in like wellness. But I, in this case, it really applies. I think that this in-betweener status allows me to live an authentic version of myself. I am the, I am authentically me here because my language skills aren't, you know, I can't, I can't, I don't want to say manipulate, but I can't use them as well as I would have in the States. But, you know, I get access to all of this new information that I didn't have in the States. And so I just feel, I feel like I have, it's raw, it's raw and it's real. And I think that, that position that I'm in of rawness at all times, you know, allows for, for my writing. I think it's really helped my writing because I, I have to come from an honest place. There's nothing I can pretend to be. I can't pretend to speak the language perfectly here. Actually, you know, I can't pretend. I can't. I, at this point in my life, we have issues with my driver's license here for three years, but I can't even drive very, very far. So I, um, I've had to just really settle into myself that I am uh, I am my home in a weird way. Like I belong where I am. And that's been a, a really huge lesson in, in my life. And I'm grateful to have learned it. I'm, you know, I'm 37, I'm going to be 38 in February. And I, I just feel like that's, it's such a big life lesson. That one, it's, I, I am my own home, no matter where I am. And that allows me to take the richness of anywhere that I am without needing to identify with it too much. I know that your children uh go to school and they're on morning shift so they'll be coming back soon and they they deserve all your all, all your attention <laughs> just just as we wrap this up um residency for a stranets for a foreigner in in bosnia and herzegovina um is 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 a minefield i shouldn't really use that word because of the past but nevertheless it is it is a a difficult thing to navigate even when you're married uh, mm -hmm. to uh, a citizen of the country. Um, has residency for you been easier than you thought or more difficult than you thought, or was it as you thought? Um, so the first time I moved here and got my residency, that was before I was a, a mother, before I had my children, um, it was much easier because my husband was employed by the technically by the state athletes are employed by the state. Uh, so it was much easier this time around he's self-employed and it's a lot harder. Um, and so, uh, as a result, we've had to kind of navigate those waters and, um, we've made that work healthcare and everything. It's a pretty simple system here. Um, but the, the hardest part has been this this issue with my driver's license, there's a, there's a date on it that they won't accept, even though it's a valid American driver's license and they should just transfer it, but there's something in the system that won't allow it. And so I, I have to, I have to do a, it's called CPP here. I don't, I don't know. It's basically um, a very big process that all young, you know, kids starting to drive, they do. You have to go through a theory class uh, for two weeks all in Slovene. It does not exist in English, especially not in my region. Um, and then you have to pass a first aid test all in Slovene. So I've done those two things, had to do it in a, completely in the language. It was very challenging. And then now I have to go take a theory test in Slovene. And then I have to do 21 hours of driving behind the wheel and then a driving test. And so it's pretty crazy. And anyone who I talk to here that knows that I'm doing this, they, they can't believe that they're forcing me to do it. So there's some challenge. There's been some challenges uh, this time around um, that I wasn't expecting, but uh, for my children, it was smooth sailing. They are Slovenian citizens, um, and they they you know they just meshed right into the system, picked up the language quickly, and it was been a bit harder for me than I I was hoping for. As we as we wrap this up, because um, uh, you've got to go. On your Substack, your Substack was about a year. Mm -hmm. And what is what is your immediate future or the plans as far as Substack is concerned? You, you alluded to the fact that you might take it in to year two. Are you of a mind to take this story and 
and let people follow it along? Or, or is it something in your mind that, no, this is finite, black or notch, do be genuine? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think my initial goal was to turn the the year into a book, and I I was hoping to gather enough wisdom from my efforts, my toiling, you know, in the soil and in 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 my kitchen and this really physical work that takes so much love. Um, I I I would really like to turn it into a book, a year of good work, and my initial plan was it would just be a book for my children that if anything were to happen to me in life or, or even not, if they just want a bit of their mother's soul going back to wild time and Materina Dushitsa, you know, if they just want a bit of their mother's soul in a book, here it is. Here's what I've learned. Here's, here, here's, here's what I believe in this phase of my life while you're little. I just, it was going to be a gift to them. And that was the initial plan. And so that I definitely want to do, but I think I'm enjoying the process so much of sharing these stories and and learning and evolving as I do the work. I don't plan to stop doing this work anytime soon. I I, I hope I I just have dreams of me as a little old lady with my cane and you know still going out to my garden. Just like my I'm surrounded by them up here in the hills, and I find them they're the most amazing people. Are these little old women who still work their land, and I. Uh, that's my dream in life. So I will keep working. I'm going to keep writing. Um, I, I think we'll, we might start doing some video, but I'm, I have some things to learn about that. But um, I, I want to keep it very honest and sacred and, uh, and raw. So that's my plan for now.